you're asking for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought some of the points that you made about um, battery costs and the range extended EVs is very interesting. Um, for low-speed EVs, that's been something that's been happening in China for years and years now, and it's been very popular. Um, according to the data that we looked at in terms of um, sort of average um, driving range for most urban residents in China, I think they range between 100 to 150 kilometers a day um, in terms of the overall commute. Um, so low-speed EVs were actually quite sufficient to meet a lot of that, and um, in terms of needing to extend the range, it's actually kind of relatively limited in terms of use. And, um, but because of a lot of the limitations around essentially um, having license to own more than one vehicle, there's a lot of restrictions on a typical household to be able to have more than one car. Um, so there is this kind of question of, well, is it okay to just have a, um, a, a shorter range vehicle or do we need to be considering um, the once every three months that we drive out to the countryside on vacation kind of stuff. Um, so there is some questions around, um, as a lot of people in the room that are familiar with Bloomberg NEF um, analysis were considered um, bullish on nickel uh, because our view is that the overall battery industry for EVs is going to be progressing towards a higher nickel cathode chemistry. So our forecast is by 2030, um, about uh, I think something 60% of the overall um, passenger EV market, I should clarify, passenger EV market um, will be uh, essentially high nickel cathode chemistry, so uh, 811 or 622. Um, and then, um, now there's obviously a sort of progression towards that um, that's going to take some time and I think we do expect battery packs eventually to hit something closer to I think something around 75 kilowatt hours or something like that by 2030 um, but not to surpass 60 by 2025 so there's still a few years to get there it definitely is going to take a little bit of ramp up time um, and there's definitely a lot of discussion we can have about what's going on in China and why it's been slowing down the last couple of years um, we've been cautioning the market for the last two years not to be too hyper aggressive about China's EV growth in 2019 and 2020. I feel like the message still hasn't been fully delivered. Um, every news article I see out there is warning, oh no, China's going to reduce EV subsidies. And it's like, yes, they told us in 2016 they were going to cut EV subsidies. Um, and they've been on that same message for the last three years. And I don't know why people still don't believe it and have consistently followed the exact policy they said they will do. So I still don't know why people think it's a surprise. but. <laughs> Um, regardless, um, so yes, in 2020 they will cut it again. By 2021, um, their original plan was that it should pretty much go to zero and be replaced by a new policy that doesn't rely on direct subsidies, but instead is more about uh, zero emissions credits. Um, but um, actually, the news is actually flipping more towards the other direction, which is that because of the impact of the macroeconomic slowdown and the trade war, now re our regulators are meeting and discussing whether or not the original schedule they had for subsidy decreases is actually too aggressive. Um, and they're possibly considering slowing it down a little bit. Um, and I think there are some questions around inter um, essentially the speed at which their domestic battery industry can catch up with um, the subsidy cuts that they were originally implementing because some of their battery makers had originally promised that they'd be able to achieve you know, $100 per kilowatt hour pack um, by uh, as early as 2020, 2021. And I think some of those battery makers were maybe a little bit generous or um, um, maybe they thought that LFP was the chemistry that so if it, in a volume weighted basis in terms of production LFP versus NMC, um, they might be able to achieve a hundred dollar per kilowatt hour if you're you know if you're averaging across the volumes that they're producing because LFP is cheaper to produce than NMC. Um, so there's there's a lot of kind of discussions I think happening internally now about well maybe the subsidy cuts are too fast the market has slowed down um, our battery makers are trying to reduce costs but maybe not as quickly as they said they originally can so maybe you know, it's time to slow it down a little bit. Yeah, but those are just in response to some of the points you brought up earlier. When I was uh, sitting with some of the Chinese automakers a few weeks ago, uh, one of the points they made is we consider um, at conferences like this, we talk about new energy vehicles, battery electric vehicles, almost exclusively. One of the points they made to me was, remember that in a macroeconomic slowdown in China, at best, in a good in the best month that we've seen, about 10% of vehicles sold were new energy vehicles. 90% were old style internal combustion vehicles. In slowdown, the central government, the provinces are not going to be concerned necessarily with selling new energy vehicles above all else. They're going to be concerned with propping up employment. 
and moving the economy along. And one of the conversations that's been had recently between the state-owned automotive makers and levels of government is the relaxation of some of the restrictions on the purchase of regular old run-of-the-mill internal combustion vehicles. As you start to relax some of the some of the social incentives, the gap between the purchase of a, of a new energy vehicle or, or an internal combustion vehicle, such as the licensing requirements that I was I was mentioning earlier, which is you you know you need to enter a license lottery and win a and win a ticket to essentially go buy the vehicle that you want anyway. If you start to relax those incentives, you do to a degree disincent the sale of new energy vehicles. But again, that's not something that you know. That's not something that the you know the the automotive manufacturers in Guangzhou are going to necessarily fight against because they're busy trying to keep as many employees as they can on the assembly lines working to produce vehicles. If nobody's buying vehicles, they're not going to have any employees. So it's you know there's a, there's some difficult trade-offs to come in an economic downturn. That's certain. Nothing to add here. All right. So. Um I think a good place to start is looking kind of specific at specific metals as they're kind of impacting the batteries. So um, I don't know if you want to give some thoughts on lithium and what's been going on there in terms of supply and demand. Uh, so definitely at the moment there's an oversupply of lithium in the market uh, and I think we've seen that with the recent shuttering of a lithium mine over in uh, Western Australia. So, but I think this is this is just merely a temporary thing. I think this is going to be quick, very quickly change very rapidly. I, I think this is just a, a readjustment, so to speak. Uh, there's, as, as John has adequately described, there is an adequate demand out there, not only in the automotive market, but there's also huge demand in the portable electronics market as well, and that, that's not going to go away anytime soon. So if anything, there's a push now to look at different lithium precursors for different uh, manufacturing methodologies in order to produce cathode materials and other uh, value-added products that go into lithium or even any other uh, lithium industry. Remember, most lithium disappears into glasses, pharmaceuticals and other areas. So at the moment, we still don't use the bulk of lithium in automotive or even any portable battery application. So there's still a very large, uh, bigger market that's being entertained before we even get to the EV area. Um, you guys are in luck. I just updated my lithium supply curve this morning um, with all the developments from the last two or three months, and there's been a lot. Um, and I actually do think that some of the recent actions taken by um, Albemarle and um, the producers in Australia has actually brought the market back into balance. Um, so based off of our projections so far, um, because of the closure or the, was, excuse me, the care and maintenance of Vagina, as well as the suspension of some of the later stage development projects in Pilbara, um, as well as um, other um, announcements that uh, have been made outside of Australia, including Albemarle pulling back on their SQM, oh, excuse me, on their Atacama expansion plans, um, and then the Moscow situation. Um, it seems like now we are actually in um, a relative supply and demand balance in the lithium resource side, so at the mined lithium level. Um, we're in a supply and balance until about 2021, 2022. Um, but then um, that's not to encourage a mass <laughs> a flood of new resource going into the market. Um, uh, what I'm saying is that we are in a good spot now and that um, some of the projects that are already kind of, you know, um, basically past feasibility stage but maybe need to wait a little bit before they uh, come into market in terms of resource, um, they, you know, it should just be a little bit more careful. Um, it was an expensive effort by Albemarle and SQM um, to essentially move into the Australian market. But what, I, we talked about this earlier. What they effectively did was bring enough of the new capacity under control, um, under their control, so that they've um, been able to retain a little bit more of the oligopoly power that they used to have, and be able to um, essentially uh, implement more discipline in terms of the overall lithium resource growth uh, pace. Um, but then at the chemical level, uh, we do see that the supply is a little bit tighter. Um, we do think that there is more carbonate under development than hydroxide. Um, and hydroxide does seem to be, especially because of the questions around some of the newer developers of hydroxide capacity, especially in China, and whether or not they're really going to be able to produce battery grade, um, that does put into question whether or not hydroxide is going to be um, really, really tight next year. Yeah, that's our view. And, and I guess I'd only add that when we do when we do our forecasting at Stormcrow, obviously we're relying on on historical data and projecting it forward. The, the 
the obvious limitations of that are we've never had a market this big, we've never sold this much, we've never had this much demand because the market has been growing each and every year. So you're always extrapolating as opposed to interpolating. That carries with it a lot of risks and the like, you know, from the statistics that you're doing, and that's fine. But one of the assumptions that comes with using that historical data is that the producers in the future are going to play as nicely and as fairly with one another as they have in the past. Now, when there were only a few producers in the space, you know, there's an Albemarle, there's an FMC, there's an SQM, that was pretty much it with a couple of small Chinese converters, having that, that power of oligopoly in the space and making sure that no one was going to step on one another in terms of trying to bring their last 2,000 tons into the market to garner just a little bit of an advantage, risking that somebody else was going to bring their last 5,000 tons into the market that risk was muted. Everybody played well with one another. It's not clear to me that's going to happen in the future. Now, if you go by historical data, the doom and gloom scenarios that Morgan Stanley and others have put out saying that we're going to see prices at, I don't know what, I don't know what material they were actually quoting, but arguably we're going to see battery lithium, battery grade hydroxide prices at $7,000 a ton. You know, if everybody plays well with one another, that's just not going to happen. Um, we do see in our modeling a, a significant contribution from the robustness, the overall size of the market in terms of buoying prices up. That's just driven by, you know, you only have so much lithium on the loading dock. If a customer comes running in with their hair on fire saying, I need 500 tons and I need it right now, you've got a much higher likelihood that somebody's going to come running in with their hair on fire on any given day when the market is large and you can gouge them and raise the average price for, you know, for the month. You know, does that happen if there are 25 independent sellers all trying to push whatever they make out the door at full capacity? No. But we're, again, we're going to need a little bit more data before we can gauge just how how reliable that historical data is compared to to what we're going to see in the you know over the next five or ten years. Maybe I can have one other thing. Um, so from the technology side of it, where we come from at CSIRO, we actually see some of this behaviour actually impeding. Uh, bringing new technology to the market, so particularly looking at different precursor solutions uh, that may be uh, a smaller environment of footprint, maybe more efficiency in manufacturing processes. A lot of the companies have invested so much in this oligopoly that they are just not willing to move from uh, to tried and true. Whether it's the best and sustainable is, is immaterial, they've just invested so much. So we find that very difficult to, to engage with them. Uh, and so we're very keen to see as many new entrants come in as possible because I think that's a real opportunity there for disruption in the market, particularly uh, new precursor materials and processes, uh, and particularly into things such as lithium metal. At the moment, uh, buying lithium metal is, is ridiculous. It's, uh, it's off the charts expensive because all the materials are basically going into precursors for battery great uh, lithium ion products. We're very interested in uh, next generation batteries, which lithium metal is pretty much uh, holds, holds everything up. And so without uh, some disruption in that area, it's going to be very hard to bring those new technologies to the market. Uh, and I think a lot of the automotive manufacturers will struggle, particularly when there's not enough material around. Sure, we have a question from the audience. Yeah, I'm just wondering, when you do your, your, your forecast, how do you take into consideration the fact that None of these might have ever met their forecast that uh, the nameplate that they, they, that they put out, and also the recoveries that are, are well short on, on what they uh, you know, originally proposed. So, so you know, we look at it, uh, you know, just as an analysis at, at, at a high level, and you know, we're always surprised by the marked difference that recoveries, for example, that. They're forecasting as high as seventy five percent on some of these spodumene projects, yet they're struggling to get to sixty. So it's not like we're talking you know, a couple of percent here or there. It's a, you know, a, a massive difference. And, and, and what we see in the market today, and the, the, the way I read it, is that uh, yeah, there seems to be a lot of pressure coming from 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 the off takers to to actually achieve uh, higher grade products. And so this, the original set out, oh, I'm going to achieve a five and a half percent, call it. Uh, 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 lithium product has suddenly gone up to six. They're, they're getting a lot of pressure to, 
to produce something closer to six. And the, the compromise for that is they, they can achieve six, but then they're going to uh, have much lower recovery. And so that ultimately t turns out in terms of the uh, you know, the LCE you, you're going to be producing from, from any product. So how do you, you, you do that when you when you look forward and you forecast that you know, the, the, the product that they're, 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 um, uh, they're being uh, uh, forced to produce today is actually quite a different product that they were being, that was being produced only 12 months ago. Uh, we take into account four different categories of risks um, that are backed by, I guess, hard reported data. Um, the financial considerations in terms of the financing conditions of each of the projects, um, the technical conditions around both the operating performance as well as the technical grade of the material that they're working with, um, political risks, and then environmental risks. Um, and uh, within the technical risks, we do have a category for this where it's essentially historical performance of how much they're actually achieving on the recovery rates. Um, and unfortunately, because so many of the spell jumping projects are still so new in terms of their um, operational data um, being actually reported for really maybe maximum two fiscal years for most of the projects. So we are just beginning to incorporate that data into the de-risking that we do for the capacity for most of these mines. But yes, so there's BNEF view on the capacity that's coming online, and it's significantly lower than the nominal capacity that these companies are saying will come online. So, so we do take it into account, but I agree with you that um, some of the performance data that's coming out from some of these projects is um, not very promising, and so we're adjusting them as they go. But since the data um, stream of the historical data stream on that is still quite um, limited, so it's just it's just only beginning to factor in at least at that one specific aspect. Yeah. So. And, and I can only say that when I'm looking at a new project and forecasting when it's going to come in, I try not to use the company's forecasts. I've seen too many of them come out and say, "Oh, it's going to take a year to build and a year to ramp." You know, have you ever done this before? Never. Okay. Well, then the, what I what I rely on are the McNulty curves more than anything else. Uh, there's not too many pieces of research out there that pertain to this space that I look at and I get angry that I didn't get a chance to do it. But McNulty's work is, is one of those pieces. And this was, a, this was a study that was done on about 200 different projects, mining projects that were coming into the market that were using new processes, old processes, were cookie cutter recreations by companies of plants they were already running to brand new green sheet designs. And he sorted these projects into particular categories and looked at how long it took them to ramp. And the data are not encouraging for a lot of the companies out there and are very sobering for an investor to look at because it ranged from, yes, if you'd built exactly this plant somewhere else, so this is your specialty, you've done this before and you're just creating a cookie cutter version of it somewhere else, it will take you between 12 and 24 months to ramp to nameplate capacity. But if you're using a new technology that hasn't been adequately piloted and demonstrated, you've never done this before, you've never built anything like this, and these are the sorts of companies that say it'll take us a year to ramp, what he sees in the historical data is 60 to 84 months to ramp to new to nameplate capacity, which generally means they'll be bankrupt, and it'll be another group that takes it to nameplate capacity at some point in the future. You're right. Most of these lithium projects have not been able to produce nameplate capacity in you know the year that they suggested. I wouldn't suggest that that makes them delayed. I would suggest that puts them on the McNulty curve. But there is sort of one point of hope in the, in the whole sphere that I see, which is POSCO itself coming into the space. They've done a remarkable job of building pilot plants, technical demonstration plants. They're walking their capacity up over time on their new process. Right now, they're running 2,500 ton per year demonstration facilities on their way towards their first commercial facility. And they have the potential to significantly raise the recovery efficiencies of brine operations from, say, 50%, 55%, where they are today, arguably, towards 85 to 90% recovery efficiencies. So there's, there's, some, there's some reasons for optimism in the space. There's also a significant historical data set that tells you that you should be pessimistic about any one individual company. All right, so maybe moving on from lithium, um, nickel has been talked about quite a bit 
um, in this space and I don't think we need to get too detailed about it because there will be a presentation on it tomorrow but um, just wondering if you wanted to comment a bit about kind of the growing market importance here of nickel <laughs> <laughs> okay so yes so CSIRO has been quite involved in nickel in recent times so uh, we've been behind the nickel west BHP nickel west pro process down in uh, in Kwanana and the production of um, battery gate nickel sulfate down there. Uh, we've had outrageous <laughs> amounts of interest in that technology for obvious reasons uh, and we're getting uh, contact from all over the world around that. We actually, um, one of the biggest issues is being able to recover nickel in a, an efficient fashion. Um, generally where you find nickel you'll also find cobalt, so where once before the cobalt was just going straight into tailings, people are now willing to actually spend the extra time and effort to actually go and recover the cobalt, even if it is like 0.1 or 0.2 percent. Uh, the, the, the value is, is there now to extract it and make uh, high value cobalt sulphate. Uh, and the other thing is is that uh, the, the scary thing for a lot of people would be that the, the battery producers and the uh, pre and the, the cathode material pro uh, producers are starting to get really savvy around this material and they want to know where the nickel and the cobalt's coming from. They want to know uh, what the mineralogy is, they want to know what the processing is, they want to know the whole, the whole you know, from the mine to when they get it because they're actually now aiming to start to move down and to start to disrupt this process. Uh, there's, um, they're finding with the product stewardship in batteries in general, they're now gonna become more and more responsible for what comes out of the ground and what happens to it at the end of life. And they wanna know how they can actually take that material at the end of its life and put it back into the, into the, into the actual uh, production stream. So that means it has to be able to come in in the same process where you're taking raw ore and turning that into nickel sulfate as well. So. Um, you guys are going to have to start to really think about how you can think about the whole value chain of nickel, not just digging it and just producing it to a, a nickel mat or something. You're actually going to have to think about what is the full product life cycle of these materials because these are the questions that we're getting and we're being asked to design processes to take all of this into account. Um, and we've had a couple of very large battery companies come to us with these questions. Yeah, the, the most common question I'm receiving when we're, when we're talking to battery manufacturers or to automotive companies, especially now as we transition towards chemistries like NMC 811, is how do I get even cleaner, even purer precursors and, and feedstock? Um, for those who aren't, who aren't aware, I like to think of it this way. Adam's going gonna, Adam's gonna to correct me later. Um, but I like to think of it this way. The higher the nickel content, in an NMC battery, the higher potentially your, your energy density goes. So think of nickel and the, and the greater the proportion of nickel in the battery as a much more, um, a much higher energy capacity for a given size battery that you end up with. And that's great, but it raises the specter, unfortunately, of breakdown in the battery and, and a loss of an accident essentially that's going to cause a fire. Um, in order to control that better, you want cleaner and cleaner and cleaner materials. So we talk blithely about battery grade lithium hydroxide. Well, that's wonderful, but it's not just saying it's 99.5% or 99.6% pure. There's, a, there's, a, there's an examination of each individual contaminant. And as you bring in your lithium hydroxide, with a certain iron content, a certain aluminum content, a certain silica content, you have to trade that off against the cobalt that you're bringing in, and the nickel that you're bringing in, and the manganese that you're bringing in, and any other material that you're bringing in. Which means, if you've got some very stringent limits, you have to be really, really careful about who you're sourcing these materials from. They not only have to produce it to within a spec, but they have to produce that spec reliably every day because if they vary a little bit outside the range, that might put you outside of spec based on what you're bringing in from other suppliers. It's an awful game. And with 811 chemistry in particular, which is the great hope for the industry because we've got lots of nickel, but we don't have a lot of cobalt and all of the rest of that story, that really makes that window of, ex of acceptability in terms of, the, in terms of the specification that you're buying very, very tight. And it's it's a tough game for these for these battery makers and these automotive companies to play, and it's getting worse. I, 
can add to that as well as you get to lower lower grade ores, you're going to have more and more of these impurities present, which means that you're going to have to spend more time cleaning it to get those impurities down, the down to the concentrations that they need. Then just because your ore body is being degraded doesn't mean that they're willing to start trading off with you. Uh, they're the end supply. They're the end supplier of the battery, and they they have um, they have really stringent. Re um, uh, rules on this for a reason for, for specifically around safety so this is something that you really need to keep in mind uh, and they they will tell you the elements which are critical in terms of impurity spectrum but they will not tell you the numbers and it's absolutely trade safe. yeah and I guess I would add also when we've been looking at this issue of sort of the adoption of high nickel cathode chemistries and the overall um, market and the speed at which it's going. Um, I would it, definitely out of all of the critical materials that we look at, um, even with cobalt and all the ethical sourcing questions around it, it's actually um, not nearly as dire as, as people have made it out to be. Um, but nickel is definitely the big question mark going forward um, because of many of these sort of technical considerations that you've brought up. And there's a lot of hopes pinned on the rise of HPAL um, projects in Indonesia, working with sulf um, um, with um, laterite ores. But as you mentioned earlier, there are still a lot of questions as to um, whether or not the HPAL process is going to be producing a product with the kind of specifications around purity um, that the batteries actually need, um, considering that they are transitioning from MPI producers. Um, so we still haven't seen a lot of evidence yet to indicate that this is definitely something that's feasible. Um, so I guess one thing that would, I would caution the audience is when we talk about nickel investments that it's a little bit beyond, oh, this is an interesting ore um, project. Um, and we really need to get um, more into the, the midstream and, and to look at. I think that the point of Indonesia is also quite tricky as well because while they've made this decision uh, and that they want to do this onshore processing in Indonesia, there's also going to be a learning curve for them. This is not something that one, one, one turns around tomorrow and slaps up a factory and away we go. Uh, all the battery producers will be in there to see. Multi curves again. Yeah, yeah, back to that. But I think could be ri really large. Uh, so I think there's this is going to have a substantial impact and already has and the nickel price doubling has put a lot of the battery manufacturers and cathode manufacturers under a significant amount of strain and uh, they, they don't really get much choice in where they recover this money from because the automotive manufacturers basically hold the, hold a big stick to their heads around these prices and this is this is another point that isn't again stressed enough making material of a specification that's going to meet the requirements for 811 is difficult. It may well be expensive. I come to conferences and people go, oh well, you know, the automotive companies will be will be happy to pay that. Happy to pay it for material that's in specification. No, they won't. Automotive manufacturing is not military aerospace. Okay? They're not willing to pay an unlimited price to achieve a specification. It has to be done at a price that makes sense to build a consumer purchasable vehicle. It's, 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 it's cost control all the way through. They are not going to pay a dime more than they were paying for other material, but they will constantly come to you and badger you for a higher specification. I'm not sure the producers in the space are they, ready. They haven't even got to making cells with 811 in it yet, so it's still at the actual, everyone knows the chemistry, it's well reported in the literature, everyone knows how to make it on the bench. You don't believe Cadle is pushing 811 no. cells? <laughs> no, not particularly. <laughs> They've still got to go through a large degree of uh, qualification before they get to where they want to be, but there's, you, all of them want it because they're getting the pull, demand, but until people can actually purchase 811 that's reliable and reproducible and within the impurity spectrum, we're not going to see it in cells because there's still another two years after that through qualification testing and safety. Yeah. I was kind of surprised actually you had a slide with one bottle that was uh, claiming it was already, use, already using a CATL Cadle, Cadle does claim and, yeah, and, and I was GAC admits that it's the, it's the 811 cell from Cadle but 
Well, so what we what we've seen, <laughs> 60, what we, so. <laughs> right? What we've seen in the battery packs is that it's um, sometimes what they've been doing is intermixing C8, C8, yeah, eight one one into with six, six two two or even five three two. Sometimes um, they even use lithium cobalt phosphate as well. Yeah, exactly. So it's not it's not just because you have one chemistry of a certain cathode in a battery pack um, that every like one hundred percent of all of the cells are using the same cathode. So that's just one one quick qualification there. Um, another thing as well is um, on on this question of um, whether or not Indonesia will rule or if other um, capacity could come online, particularly for instance Australia, and I think that's really relevant for this audience, is um, just exactly who has that technical capacity or that uh, latent um, sort of know-how or IP to be able to bring this capacity online. And I feel like it's a little bit un, um, unanswered. Um, for in, now, for Indonesia, um, they have had historically successful um, HPAL projects, um, but then Sumitomo has also demonstrated that when you try to ramp up a project, it may not work out as well as you like it to do. So even when you have very experienced operators trying to ramp up a project, um, they still experience delays um, to the tune of probably 12 to 18, even 20 months. Um, but, but Australia historically has not really been utilizing this technology either. And so um, I do feel like, I mean, I'm super keen on the BHP Nickel West project and you know I wish them luck, but it, there's still a lot of remaining questions around um, even if you, uh, even if Australia did have a bigger role to play on the nickel chemical level, just where are we finding all of those skilled people? Um, so that's uh, the Nickel West process is now part of the uh, Future Battery Industry CRC, and so there's a $10 million project which is to go into uh, precursor manufacture and then into cathode. So there's part of that is also all the skills training, engineering and everything to actually get to 62 and 811 and that'll be done over the next three years. Uh, together with that BHP is also making the investment in the production facility because they, they made the decision to keep Nickel West uh, early this year when there had been some talk that they were going to get rid of it. So they see that as a, an important part of their future I believe and that's going to be I think an exciting, uh, an exciting thing for Australia to be part of the battery industry. But then the final thing is the cost. Right? Ah, <laughs> everything costs, right? I'm a scientist. Come on, spend some money. It's not going to kill you. Anyways, it, 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 there is still some questions around essentially, um, uh, even with all the skill sets in place, even with the facility oh, yeah, in place, absolutely. Um, at the end of the day, you are competing against very, very cost competitive Indonesian operations I think that are running on low cost hydro. I don't and think you should hydro. underestimate the geopolitical yeah. aspects of this as well. So yeah. uh, I think that there's going to be a lot of companies who are going to come here because they we're stable, we're seen as you know, well governed, and there's a real uh, challenge in terms of these materials, and people want to have diversity of opportunity and so I think you're going to see a large amount of the automakers and the battery manufacturers make substantial investments over the next few years would be my uh, genuine belief. All right well thanks to the panel who keep asking the questions for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, looking at kind of fueling a little bit more growth in the market um, where is the money going to be coming from to kind of spur a little bit more exploration whether it's in Australia or globally. No, it's not my link, that's your industry. <laughs> um, I guess safe to say right this minute, Amy, it's not coming from the capital markets. Uh, that's a given. We've seen substantial interest from a very few educated private equity funds. Um, we're seeing substantial interest from a corporate side. Um, whether they you know, be end users of the material or just interested in getting into the battery material space because it, it has that growth factor attached to it. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, I don't think we're going to see a sudden, you know, rekindling of the flame in the capital markets. It doesn't work that way. I mean, we had a, we had a bubble that effectively burst. It's going to take a bit of time for people to forget how much money they lost the last time and come back in. Um, you know, and that's just a fact of life. So, you know, it's going to continue to come from where it's come from in the past short while, which is corporate users, interested parties, and, you know, the few educated investors out there, be my guess. Great. So um, can I turn it over to the audience, see if you have any questions? Uh, yep, we've got one over here. <coughs> know your view on the um, like the battery only has certain lifespan and so one that's ended 
I know there's one or two companies starting to talk about recycling, reconditioning. So where's that trend going, that technology? Can you just give me some more information on what you know, please? Happy to talk to that. So there's two two parts of the story. One of that is second life. So that's where, at the end of life, the automotive battery can be taken out and put into into a new application. That one, um, to borrow the parlance, is um, got hairs on it because if you take a battery from a car, who's going to uh, check the capacity, check the how it's been used, understand whether it's been in an abuse situation before it's then on sold for another application, whether that be storage in the home or the grid or wherever. So there's a huge amount of regulatory issues around how do you warrant that battery because the last thing you'd want is to have that battery to fail and burn a house down. So who, who, who would carry the can for that would be, would be essentially the question. So there's regulators uh, will have to, and science, regulators will have to work out what is the regulatory framework for that, and then there's scientists like myself and others who will have to work out, well, how are we going to assess batteries to determine what their state of health is for that type of process. In terms of recycling, there's simply not enough volume. Um, I was lucky enough to meet uh, Umacor last week and uh, talk to them about what they're doing. They have a um, small industrial pilot plant in Belgium where they're doing uh, 5,000 tonnes per year of recycling and that's as much as they can get their hands on at the moment because there's just not enough EV vehicles in the market where they can actually recycle them at, at, at the scale that they need to get to for um, uh, to, to get to a volume that's workable yeah. yet. Um, we at CSIRO, we, we wrote a report about recycling in Australia, which you can find on our website, csiro.au, and there we talked about the recycling situation in Australia. We only recycle 3% of lithium-ion batteries in Australia at the moment. Um, I think most of you in the room would put your hand in the air if you've got at least five or six mobile phones at home. You're worried about the security of all those photos, selfies you sent? Um, you should be handing the batteries in if you can. And that, that would cure some of the problem, but most people keep their batteries. People don't return them to a collection depot where we can actually collect, collect the actual materials out of them. Most of the old batteries are full of cobalt. Uh, they're easily recyclable because they're pure cobalt, so there's plenty of value in them. Uh, but again, we need a proper um, policy framework from the government to actually encourage people to hand them in so they can be collected and then put back and uh, recycled. So I know that Lithium Australia is here and they work together with EnviroStream around uh, shredding of batteries, but they are now moving their material onto uh, Korea. But there's definitely an opportunity here in Australia for us to, to get into the, the recycling space and use that to augment our own natu natural mineral supplies. What, what, um, what about Yeah, it's just, you're just about phone batteries, but what about other batteries, like the current car batteries that we have, toys batteries, all those batteries that can be recyclable or not? Yeah, so your primary alkaline uh, batteries, they, they generally just go straight into the waste, unfortunately, right. but they should be recycled. They have manganese in there. They have a very caustic electrolyte in there. That's why they leak. Uh, again, it all comes back to societal. Uh, we all know to recycle our lead acid batteries. No one would ever go and t dump one of them in the river or put that in the bin. We all know to take that back to a collection depot. So it really comes down to what are the policy framework are the state and federal government's going to put in place in order to actually encourage recycling. And around that, you have the Australian Battery Recycling Initiative, or ABRI, and they're ag uh, actively uh, pursuing the Australian government around this. In Europe, you've got U Recharge, which is also trying to encourage more recycling. In Europe, they're actually talking about banning certain battery chemistries in the near future in order to, uh, and also uh, enforcing product stewardship laws on a lot of these companies to ensure that they take them back and they deal with them properly at the end of the life. But that's something where we, which we haven't got to here in Australia. Uh, but back to your original point on the automotive, there is just not enough volume to justify recycling at this moment. I would also add, um, so we did a study on China, the US, and EU, and did some modeling around the cost of recycling large format batteries. Um, and according to the announced plans by different Chinese companies from now until 2030 about essentially how much recycling capacity they're planning, because the government has a very strict sort of full life cycle requirements for all um, EV batteries as they're being deployed. Um, 
they have enough capacity planned by 2030 to handle all large format batteries that will be discarded in China by 2030. Um, so it's really impressive. Um, now, whether or not that's going to be cost competitive, well, we found out in the end, um, we did a bunch of sensitivity analysis around, you know, recovered commodity prices, you know, how much would it be, waste material, blah, blah, blah. Um, and what we actually found out, the biggest part of the overall logistics that is prohibitive in terms of cost is the transport, transport and storage of batteries after they've been, um, they've been uh, discarded. So I'm super curious to hear um, the perspective from, for instance, Lithium Australia and your experience working in a much more geographically distributed market like Australia versus that in China. Because what we did is when we compared the economics of it for the US, Europe, and China, what we found out was just because of the sheer density of the capacity that they're planning in China, especially they have this impressive network of middlemen um, assembly facilities, collection facilities that they plan for pretty much every major uh, city and every major nodal hub in a city too. It's 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 pretty crazy what they're what the amount of capex that they're planning to put down for this stuff. Um, it makes the cost of um, their uh, large format battery recycling much more competitive. Um, whereas in Europe and the U.S., um, because of a much more centralized system and longer distances between the places that you're collecting these recycled batteries and lower volumes, because of course you just simply have less cars on the road, um, it's it's a lot less economic, um, and it's not actually the commodity prices themselves are not the most important factor in deciding whether or not recycling a battery is going to be cost effective. Um, so, anyways, I'd love to talk to you about it afterwards, but we're running out of. I think the only point to make is um, there's ways and means of recycling. It's how far you want to go. You can just disassemble the pack and get back to the module of the cell, and then you can just incinerate it, or you can cut the cans open and start trying to separate everything out. As soon as you start bringing more manual handling in, you bring more safety issues, you bring more cost. Um, it still makes it relatively economic, but again, it's it's what you want to recover. So one of the biggest issues is graphite. Uh, if you incinerate it, your graphite goes up the spout. Uh, but then we're, now we have a crunch around graphite at the moment because the Chinese government said we're not going to keep manufacturing artificial graphite. It's just too uh, toxic uh, because of the manufacturing process. So there's now huge interest in natural graphite. But again, you can't incinerate that because you're just losing a valuable resource to the sky. So um, again, we need new pro processes to be able to do this at scale with as minimal involvement as possible of the human. All right, so I think we have time for one more question before we wrap up. I um, just want to go back to the um, HPAL um, debate. So obviously HPAL has been used to process uh, nickel laterate ores, uh, hugely expensive huge difficulties with commissioning problems. We've seen the capital intensities of those come down over more recent times with the Chinese taking on those projects. Um, there's been a lot of talk about new processes coming on where we are sort of removing high pressure leach and replacing that with atmospheric leach. Um, just your view on, on the relative potential of that coming off and the relative um, expected capital difference, which could make certain projects that are uneconomic at the moment very economic and very financeable. I can talk to the technical aspects, whether you want to talk about the finance, you might want to point at these people. Um, uh, I think definitely, again, if it comes down to chemistry, then there are ways and means of doing it. The question is, is whether you need a huge piece of kit to actually get it done whether you need to handle significant volumes of acids uh, and, and then what, what does the waste stream look like and can you, are you set up next to somewhere that can take your waste stream and value add that waste stream or reuse that waste stream? At the end of the day, most of these things are, can be technically solved, but the question is whether you can do it at an economic level is, is really critical. But it does also come down to what is the ore? What is the quality of the ore that you're bringing into this process? If it's full of impurities, it doesn't matter how, how good your process is, you're going to have to stick more and more flotation processes. You're going to have to put more and more um, flow, uh, other agents in there in order to recover and separate different li liquor stages, stages so that you can actually get the material out. And this is the problem with a lot of the ore bodies. As, the, as that grade of nickel or other material degrades, you're going to have to do more processing. So at some point, sometimes these things are going to get more expensive because you're going to have to put in more steps to clean up the material. I, I usually tell people that at one point or another I, I let them know that I'm one of the only alchemists that exists in the world because as, as a physicist I, I was engaged in a project at one point where we were bombarding a lead target 
with heavy ions and we were turning some of the atoms into radioactive gold in order to measure some properties coming off. And, it, you know, hey, lead to gold. It's alchemy. The, the, the three things I told them they can't ask was, don't ask me how much we made, because it was numbered in atoms. Don't ask me how expensive it was, because it was really expensive. And, and don't ask me how long we had it for, because it wasn't very long. <laughs> um, you know, you can do anything uh, to a degree. What's gonna, what it's going to come down to, especially with respect to batteries, is how expensive is it, for example, to take that new process and turn what comes out of it into battery-grade nickel sulfate or battery-grade cobalt sulfate. If the answer is too damn expensive because getting to battery-grade means that I'm trying to take too many contaminants out of it, again, we're back to that argument that the automotive industry is not military aerospace. All right, great. So I think we will wrap it up there for the day. If we could just give a round of applause to the audience.